things, you'd be surprised how close it is to you. I found out, but that was only later. Every day for 22 years, I drove past this dry wash on the way to my shop. And in all those years, I didn't once take the time to look or even listen to the sounds that roared at me from behind that stand of scrub. It was here a lot of kids in the neighborhood got to racing around in their go-karts, making a lot of dust and noise. But when I retired, I started looking around me and learning about this world they call off-road. Here's how you get there. On three wheels, four, six wheels, or two. You can make that world for yourself on any steep hill. Especially the kind that dares you to spit out the dust and keep coming back at her. Wide open is the only way to the top. Sometimes a spectator takes his chances, along with the driver. Well, you're right. Dirt is dirt, no matter where you find it. What, what made it different for me, though, was the kind of people that moved around in it. Oh, I'm gonna... I wanted to get to know them better, you know? How they think and how they feel and... Well, you know, the highs, the lows, that kind of thing. Well, I, I got a lot of time on my hands, and, well, I I thought this would be a good way to spend it. Well, here we go. One of the first things I learned was that the off-road world is a family affair. You take bikes, for instance. You'll find machines that match up in size and weight for every member of the family. When the kids start going head to head, they bring along the fiercest rooters in the world. Everybody's a future Joel Robert, Malcolm Smith, or Roger DeCoster. Yeah, like the man says, sometimes you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. a few more years, they're ready for motocross. Man, machine, and dirt. Kidney-shaking bumps, grinds, and a guy who will stop at nothing to win, or at least beat you out. exactly been strangers to the automobile. Even back when they called them horseless carriages, all it took was one vehicle, one man behind the wheel who wouldn't settle for the ordinary, and the love affair between dirt and driver began. The movie people are always ready to get in on a good thing, and they gave us this thrilling tale. 
In this early Hollywood saga, we see the story of a young man out for a quiet spin in the country. Suddenly, he decided he'd had enough of the ordinary. Off he goes, off looking for adventure and danger. found the danger. When I was a boy, we had our heroes. Big names like Barney Oldfield, Eddie Rickenbacker. They went to work on the cars, stripped the body, tore off the fenders, beefed up engines, challenged not only each other, but the limits of their rigs. Would you believe you could get up to 14 horsepower in one of these bombs? These early road racers challenged a strongly held scientific concept. The experts told us we'd never be able to drive faster than 50 miles an hour. A human wouldn't be able to breathe going that fast. Nowadays, progress has come so far, we all breathe air like this. Now the cars got faster, the crowd's bigger, speeds of over 100 miles an hour. You can only push so far. Drivers learn to live or die with danger and with dirt. Out of that came the sprint car. 1,600 pounds, a handcrafted racer. Open cockpit. They called for constant oversteering. Power sliding turns. Tommy Falls, Peter Earl, Ascot, just names to you? Well, 40 or 50 years ago, they were the tracks where men like Rick Ferkel, Jan Opperman, Smokey Snellbacker put it all on the line 85 times a year. Today, the world of dirt is pushed way past the oval track and the sprint car. You find all kinds of machines. Like these dragsters. Digging into the dirt, these dragsters explode from a standing start into speeds of 120 miles an hour in three seconds or less. Well, sir, I got my first taste of the world of dirt here in the National Sand Drags in Bakersfield, California. And it's a mighty nice place to be. Here I met Tommy Robertson, certainly... top national drag racing competitor. Bakersfield has got it all. I tell you, Fred, here in Bakersfield, we got the best cars running. We got modified Jeep Classic, we got dune buggies, we got hot dragsters, we got Fred. Uh, Fred? Yeah. Uh, did you come here to see the cars or uh, something else? Well, uh, I guess I came to see everything. Uh, well, you came to the right place. Listen, Fred, here at Bakersfield. We got just about everything. Modified class, Jeeps, Chevy Blazers, buggy. But for my money, the superstars are the fuel-burning dragsters. And those babies are pushed by as much as a thousand horsepower.
That's a flame out, Fred. Somebody just kissed $15,000 goodbye. Tommy sent me on to Pismo Beach, California, and another kind of sand drag competition. And I met another inhabitant of this world of dirt, Randy Gardner. You're not kidding. I come Labor Day, Pismo Beach is where it's at. You're gonna see it all here. I mean, they got classes for more kind of buggies than you can ever believe. drag races, but the meanest, baddest doom climbs you ever saw. like a hill climb in one respect. You have to make it to the top. <laughs> if you say so. Hey, go get him! Here at Pismo, they got so many different kinds of machines entering, they keep inventing new classes. <laughs> just can't keep up with everybody. That's a buddy of mine on a 46 Ford hood. I kind of forgot something called the law of friction. <laughs> That's called flying by the feet of your pants. From Labor Day to the 4th of July is 10 months. And from the ocean dunes of Pismo Beach to the base of Pikes Peak is 1,300 miles and 5,400 feet of elevation. tell you that this is the granddaddy of off-road racing. Since 1916, the Pikes Peak Hill Climb has taken its toll of cars and motorcycles. This 14-mile course is still as dangerous and as much of a challenge to racing driver Rick Mears. Now, he and his brother, Roger, have been daring the tight turns and sheer drops of the Pikes Peak Hill climb since 1972. 
It's also a family tradition for young Bobby Unser Jr. The Unsers have been putting this one away for the last eight years. These spectators don't blow too much of it off. Louis Unser builds engines. His machines have been some of the fastest on the mountain. Bobby Unser is here today in the unfamiliar role of spectator. Along with Parnelli Jones. Rick Mears and Peter Firestone check out Rick's tires. They've taken sprint tires and regrooved them so the tread can cut through the loose gravel to grab onto solid ground and find traction. Well, I thought about cutting it, but this corner's just a step. That's right. By cutting it and softening it, we'll let it put more pressure on the center part of the tire. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Make the whole thing work a little more. See how it sounds like. I, I agree. <laughs> we'll both find out. It's right. not going to hurt you. Uh -uh. There goes Bobby Yunser, Jr. He looks like he's making pretty good time as we watch him go. The family follows his progress. Above Glen Cole. We can see him there, and he's really moving. The crowd is appreciating a good brace. He's, he's in a curve. His tail is moving a little sideways going out of those curves. Apparently, the road's a little loose. He's skating just a little bit. Bobby Jr.'s time, 12 minutes, 52 seconds. Something for Rick Mears to beat. That and 14 miles of switchback road, 156 turns, and a climb of 9,392 feet. your enemy. First it's behind you, then it owns your windshield on a snaky left-hander. Now for a hard right-hander. Come in at 100 miles an hour, stand on the brake, throw your car sideways. then flat out through the S's. Now for a blue sky turn. Nothing for markers, but blue sky. speeds, Rick turns his wheel right to go left and left to go right. The racers call this opposite lock. In the dirt, it's all opposite lock. feet down. A lot less if you're lucky. After eight years of Unser domination, today there's a new winner. Rick Mears puts Bobby Unser in second place by over 40 seconds.
I got down to earth in a hurry at the Indian Dunes Cycle Park, some 40 miles or so north of Los Angeles, where I took in the National Women's Motocross Championships. I met a great young gal, Dee Williams, 17. But when it comes to motocross racing, no longer a novice. <laughs> Hi, Fred. Dee's been racing competitively for uh, three years? Well, a little more than two and a half, almost three. You know, it's really great. A lot of women get into motorcycles because of their families. That's my friend Melanie Evans over there with her dad, Walker. He's part of Carnelli Jones' off-road racing team. <laughs> Tell me, Dee, is racing something you can do on a full-time basis? We're getting there. The prize money's coming along. This race has prizes of over $1,000. Well, that's respectable. Hmm, sure can help. Like when you look at the equipment a racer has to wear, to say nothing of the cost of, you know, keeping up a bike. You take all the help you can get, including tips on strategy. Every year you see more and more young women turning out for races here at Indian Dunes and other tracks around the country. I like the motocross. It's a short race with a lot of whoop to doos and tight turns. In fact, I think motocross can make you a better driver. If you last out the course. <laughs> yeah, that's part of it too. Across, I see, is it beginning to make its own big name. Sue Fish, Jan Turton, Jean Cazar, and a lot of others trying to prove their own thing. Well, let me tell you, when you weigh in at 95 pounds, a 175-pound bike can be one big mother. It's a hell of a big difference between the beauties of the women's motocross to the beasts you'll see plowing their way through the swamp buggy races here in Naples, Florida.
kids come all the way down here to see these races? Well, we've been down here for a couple months, and we just happened on to them. We've heard of them, and we decided we'd come and see them. All the way back in Indiana, you've heard of them? Oh, yes. Hey, yeah. Sam, I'll tell you what, you'll really enjoy it. If this is your first race, it's uh, something that's really a sight to behold. It's, uh, it's uh, like a Daytona and Indianapolis and everything else all in one. Driving my swamp buggy Down here in the Florida Bayou Country, they've been running a competition over the uh, Naples Mile of Mud for over 30 years. And a fellow that's figured in most of those races is Swamp Rat Pickering. Swamp Rat, I got to say that those are funny looking critters. Yeah, we build them to get the job done, Fred. High and tall on thin wheels. So you can work your way through these backwaters and shoals of the Florida Everglades. Yeah. We're going to see seven different classes of races today. Well, I got to say that that's a mighty mean looking course. Yeah. We got in front of us here a figure eight trench of varying depths. The main feature is Sippy's Hole. Yeah, named after Sippy Morris. He never seemed to miss all them bumps he put on that pile of water. <laughs> They got extra heavy rear axles and wheels. Even water-filled tractor tires. Give you the extra traction you need to work your way out of Sippy's hole. I knew we was gonna get along, Fred. <laughs> The ideal swamp buggy has a center of gravity high enough so you won't sink to the bottom, but low enough so the sucker don't turn over. Sometimes you just can't figure it. Swamp lady. 
water out there, you gotta coat your power plant with a whole lot of plastic cement to seal the electric system. Then you spray away with a garden hose. And if you don't miss none, you're ready. This is a good, clean sport. Really builds character. And safe? Hell, I can't remember the last time we lost a contestant to a water moxie, much less an alligator. So you folks don't pay no attention and no mean talk. Y'all come. You hear? Swamp buggy people hid the pitfalls of their race underwater. There's no such modesty here at Riverside Raceway on the edge of the California desert. This motocross circuit is designed to turn ten or twelve thousand dollars worth of racing car into instant junk. There are 40,000 spectators at this event, which tries to jam the frills and rigors of a 100-mile desert race into 1.7 miles. One race where survival pays off. Anything goes for jeeps, beetles, dune buggies. It's self-destruction carried to a high art. If you can finish, you've made it to a very select group. Park City, Utah. Home of Utah's Skyline Snow Rally of fierce competition pitting man and machine against the side of this hill. Here's where it happens. 310 feet high on a 58 degree incline. A large number of people turned out today. 
drawn primarily by their interest in the scientific and engineering ramifications of this event. The hill started as a ski jump. When too many ski jumpers dropped dead, the Park City people had to find another use for it. In ski country, no hill ever goes to waste. And today, certainly not this one. In the years of the Skyline Rally, no one has ever made it to the top, but a lot of them sure try. Hey, is it cold up there? <laughs> to a contest between two brothers, Mike Brown and Randy Brown. As far as, as, far as we're concerned, we won the class because he was the light for to begin with. There seems to be some sort of disagreement. Yeah, he's run the same engine, uh, but the machine weighs under 1,000 pounds. I'm weighing 1140, and it just doesn't qualify for the class. My brother drove the same rail in the same class last year. Now he's protesting me for driving it because I beat him. We got a little, little family feud, brothers. Now he's got to run against me. Now he can't handle losing. You gotta, you gotta be a good loser as long as a good winner. It's tough. I wait, I know what it weighs. Where's your weight slip, Big Bob? I'm out to have fun. I ain't they want to protest me, let them protest. To settle this family feud, the brothers each get one more run at the hill. Mike goes first.
Now it's Randy's turn. The family will be fighting this one out for another year until the next Skyline Snow Rally. Ever since I first moved into the world of dirt and off-road racing, I began to hear a few names. Races like the Parker, the Mint 400, and always the Baja 1000. And when you hear about the Baja, you also hear the name Parnelli Jones. I figured it was time I looked into the famous race shop where Parnelli Jones builds his famous Formula One race cars, stock racers, Indy cars, and off-road racers. When I was there, Parnelli and his chief mechanic, Dick Russell, were looking to the Mint 400. And beyond that, the Baja. We build a lot of cars. I mean, we build Indianapolis cars, and we, of course, built our off-road cars and stuff like that. And as far as I'm concerned, building cars is like having a baby. Yeah, that's okay. Working on this special Chevy Blazer, they struggled to increase the uh, independent axle travel from 8 inches to 18. Uh, that'll let the Blazer maintain higher speeds over rougher courses without bottoming out. The car is very much a personality, so to speak. It is enjoyable building and putting your own ideas into these cars. Every nut, every bolt in the Blazer has been refined to make it stronger, lighter, faster, to meet the challenge of the Nevada desert. And after that, the Baja. First, Las Vegas and the Mint 400. <laughs> Fremont Street today has been turned into an off-road version of Indy's Gasoline Alley, with cars from all over the country moving in for technical inspection. Equipment and accessory manufacturers set up on Fremont Street to display their products. An enterprising car owner can get himself quite a collection of decals. Hey, give me a uni sticker and oh, put it sure, right up there. Man, look at that decal. I'll tell you what, you know, you are just slick. Well, good luck super. to you in the race. Hey. Hey. Dennis, how are you? Ah, oh, darn. Hey. hey, I see you switched to Pennzoil. Well, no, that was my co-driver uh, last race. He, uh, look, if you've got those big decals, we can cover that up uh, if you got a couple of cases. A couple of cases? Yeah, it's been burning a lot of oil. Uh, yeah, I got a couple decals that will cover that decal up real good. Hey, that's good, Dara. Uh, thank you, Dennis. You're welcome, Bill. Well, I see you're ready for racing, I see, but with the wrong spark plug. Let's get the <coughs> champions in this thing. I've been thinking about changing, Arnold. You know, if I could get some for my tow car, uh, I think I could just put those decals on here. You know, I need a or, few boxes yeah. for my tow car. Let's get these on first, and I'll get some plugs for you. I'll get them right up there. And then we'll fix up your truck. It's going to look great, I don't know. Good enough. But most everybody else is here for racing to get ready for the Baja. names. Pennelly Jones ready to take his crack at the desert to see if his blazer is ready for the Baja. It's 400 miles of rugged desert, sagebrush and hard rock. Pennelly's new axle travel holds up. The Blazer hits 130 and doesn't bottom out.
Campanelli never did like to use his horn. Racers are ready to go on the course. The team of Rick Mears and Doc Sowers. motorcycle champion, is moving in on the four-wheelers. Malcolm and his partner, Bud Feldkamp, are already thinking past the mint to the Baja 1000. Hollywood stunt driver Bobby Farrow in his Sandmaster Doom buggy. There are seven checkpoints along the course, and every racer knows he's going to make pit stops. This is the other half of the Parnelli Jones racing team. settles again on the Nevada desert, there's a new winner, Bobby Farrell. But the others will have their crack at him again at the thousand. I had a couple of places I wanted to see before I hit the Baja. One, Terre Haute, Indiana, and the National Tractor Pull Contest. With over a million dollars in prize money every year, when they aren't plowing, they're pulling. Everybody knows a tractor is for off-road work. But if anyone thinks that these farmers in the Midwest can't be competitive with those big rigs of theirs, they ought to talk to Janice Hopper here. You bet they are, Mr. Gordon. Terre Haute is just one of the number of competitions we go to every year. They're not going to race around the course, are they? Oh, hardly. The idea is to see who can pull a predetermined weight the farthest. The big idea is to get the most traction you can. Some farmers add ballast to get up to the last ounce of allowable weight. Here's how 
it works. A sled is attached to the rear of the tractor. Now, when the tractor starts up, an artificial weight load of 5,000 pounds is mechanically transferred from the rear of the sled to the front. At full transfer, this builds up to a dead weight of 50,000 pounds. Some poor man just burned up $15,000 worth of tractor engine. These machines don't look like any tractors I've ever seen. Oh, you're right. A lot of invention goes into these tractors. Some people put thousands and thousands of dollars into their machines. We don't have too much in this because they come out of a junkyard and then we do all grown work. So we take a lot of the guys, they take them somewhere and some of them guys get ten, twelve thousand dollars just from getting getting the engine work done on them. That's not counting the track. They probably Seven got a years years track track on the side. Oh, and here's a friend of my dad's who built his tractor front of three hundred dollars. <laughs> This guy may have built a $300 tractor, but those tires have got to be $1,000 a throw. Back up! We took off and, and went about 30, 40 foot. You run lean on fuel, and when it does that, why, well, it sets that fuel off in the intake, and boom. <laughs> propulsion today. Diesels, dune buggy engines, even blown engines that burn nitromethane to develop up to 2,000 horsepower. Recognize that? It's a jet that turns out 10,000 horsepower. John Harness out of Danny, Indiana, riding loudmouth line. Terre Haute is just one of the many stops on the tractor pull circuit from Connecticut to Colorado, from Ontario to Florida. Today, it's this man with the 12 feet. Tomorrow, well, tomorrow's another day and another fairground. For me, tomorrow was Yakima, Washington, where the Yakima Ridge Runners hold their annual Jeep Rodeo. It's sort of like a private war. You know, Bob, you could probably consume just as much beer without the race. But here in the Northwest, they go for strong motivation. They like to spice up their drinking with a lot of organized mayhem. I wouldn't say this is mayhem. Oh, you wouldn't. That's not what I heard. Okay, it's not mayhem, but it is the meanest, filthiest race you can find on God's green earth. We race modified cars. <laughs> you mean modified engines? Well, we play a little with the front ends, turn them into battering ramps to eliminate the competition. When the race starts, you want all the protection you can get. Most of the course is underwater, except in the dry season, when it's hip deep in mud. When we remember, we run four heats in each of four classes.
just thought that a jeep was a submarine. When I told him he was crazy, he laughed right in my face. Then he took a swig from a jug of wine, put his jeans up round his waist. He said, this here's a four-wheel drive, but you know what I mean. So I looked him in the eye and said, but it ain't no submarine. Well, I couldn't convince that boy that fool that a jeep ain't a submarine. He cranked the motor over and headed for the stream. He almost had me convinced that he drove a submarine. But in the water flying, he entered in the race. And the grim determination was written on his face. Well, the rest of us just stood there. We laughed until we cried. While one by one, those four-wheel drives sputtered, coughed, and died. And full-grown men and all that mud was the funniest thing I've seen. Those good old boys learned on their own that a jeep ain't a submarine. Well, I couldn't convince them poor damn fools that a jeep ain't a submarine. You gotta be alert and quick out there. If you ain't, you're gonna know it pretty damn soon enough. <laughs> Somebody ought to throw water on them, too. Adept all the tricks of racing. Sterling Moss called his thing tailgating. We do it one better. He entered in the race, and grim determination was written on his face. Well, the last time that I saw him, he was singing out of sight. And he turned and saw me watching him with a look of pure delight. And just before that muddy water came in his machine, he laughed and yelled, You're right, my friend, this ain't no submarine. I guess that I'll remember until the day I die. The day old Bobby took a dive when the creek was running high. Well, it helps if you're half crazy and the other half's just me. Cause it takes a special kind of fool to think a jeep's a submarine. Well, I couldn't convince that boy damn fool that a jeep ain't a submarine. No, I couldn't convince that boy damn fool that a jeep ain't a submarine. The only real equipment you need here is a strong stomach and a real deep dyed streak of meanness. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, come on up and show us. It's almost half a continent from Yakima to Ensenada and a whole world of attitudes. But this was the place I knew I had to be. By the time I got there, the impound area was filling up with over 500 vehicles ready for inspection before they took off on what many think is the toughest off-road course in the world. The last few days, the thousands of men and women who will be a part of this race, in the vehicles or on the course, have been pouring into town. Can't get everybody, much less anybody, to agree just when this race was first held. But it was in uh, oh, 1966, 67 that a bunch of the boys got gassed, decided to dare each other to drive the length of Baja from Tijuana to La Paz. But progress caught up with the racers. The Mexican government paved the road. Now, every year, they have to follow a different course. Now, 
Well, they start here, and they cut over to Sawmill, then come down through here, through Mike Sky Ranch, up through the mountains the first time, down to San Felipe. Then they cut straight up through the desert, swing over here, come through the mountains a second time before they come back. If they get back. Now the fun and games are over. You've driven the course for the last time. There's nothing more you can do to your machine in the impound area. By nightfall, there are probably 20,000 people at the various checkpoints spread over a thousand mile course. It's a long, hard day ahead. It's a time for contemplation, for quiet, for rest. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you can get close enough to the bar and who songs for some last minute bench racing. <laughs> Six a.m. The motorcycles take off, and the Baja is underway. Las Vegas makes him the man to beat. The team of Doc Sowers and Rick Mears. Doc will drive the first leg and Rick will pick up halfway through. Mickey Thompson is driving the day with a broken back. A special air hose to his helmet lets Mickey breathe filtered air. Nellie Jones starts 45th. Walker Evans starts right behind Parnelli. They leave at one minute intervals.
part of the tradition of the Baja is local participation. Here's some Ensenada kids add an extra bump to the course just beyond the blind right-hand corner. Parnelli knows the kids. He's driven too many of these races, so he gives them a show. driver goes through these positions, his progress is radioed to race headquarters and the data fed into a special computer so they can figure elapsed time. He's a dog. Hey, friend. Yeah. Any news? Yes, I'll way the hell down there. God knows when they'll be here. The information comes down to various checkpoints. Right now we're at uh, Trace Hermanus, one of the last of the checkpoints. By the time the racing cars get here, there will be fewer of them. All we can do is listen for names that we know and wonder what it's really like out there under that hot, baking desert sun. And there's a lot of times out there in the race where you say to yourself, what am I doing here? I gotta have holes in my head. I mean, this is no fun. But when you're able to hit a stretch that uh, doesn't have too many rocks and you can slide the car around and, and do a little driving or something, you know, then you get your thrill out of it. Another racer has his own ideas. Some guys will tell you the worst is the sun. For my money, it's the damn duck. You just can't tell where you are or what's ahead of you.
like, you know, your head starts to wander, and then you think, am I on the course? Did I, did I miss a marker? And then you see somebody broken down, and you know you're still in the race. When a guy comes up behind you and you can't see him or hear him and he comes crashing into you. <laughs> That'll shake you up. to listen. It's early, but already we know the Baja is taking its toll. You wonder how many of them will ever get here to use this gas. You want to know what you do if your tire goes flat or you lose one? You got no choice. Three wheels is better than two. Well, I'll tell you what they look like. Yeah, about four hours into the race, all those cars start looking like a bunch of wounded insects. I mean, I, well, I come around the corner and I see my engine's on fire, right? Well, I get so wild, I, I, I forgot completely. I bought this new fire extinguisher. The thing set me back $300. And I'm out there on my hands and knees trying to blow out the fire. comes in from Mike Sky Ranch. Ferro is out in front and pushing hard, but Parnelli is closing on him fast.
you gotta look out for each other out there. One mechanic, one lookout. Or you get yourself wiped out in one big hurry. There are some guys who just go nuts out there. The Baja really gets to them. Well, I'll tell you, you gotta keep going. I caught a flat, had to scrounge a spare from a guy. It was the wrong size, but it beats sitting out on that mountainside. see something that really shakes you. Yeah, well, it helps to get back where you ought to be. You really feel great when you hit the dry leg. I mean, you can cook. 130, 140, flat out. It was easy to figure. Guys like Bobby Farrell and Walker Evans were on to Dry Lake and making time. Parnelli's out. Then word flashed along the course. Bobby Farrell crosses the finish line with a new record. against the clock. Hey, Walker Evans still has a chance to take it all. Walker's pushing all the way, but it's not good enough by four minutes. Watch out! He settles for a second overall, but first in his class. A lot of people broken down out there, Walker? Yeah, just cars everywhere. 
just about four miles or five miles back, I missed a turn. Don't, I don't have a bit of brakes on you. Know right. I just took out a fence and everything. <laughs> Dusty and hot. You're my hero. All right. It's pretty hot, huh? Yeah. Well, that's 35 years old, huh? <laughs> got me a lot of trouble out there. Iron <laughs> man. I told you I was going to do it, didn't I? Did I tell you? <laughs> pretty tired? Shit. <laughs> There are a lot of guys still out on the course, still racing, will be, till three or four in the morning. When the sun goes down, it's, it's pretty easy to get lost out there. I mean, most of the guys are just, just wandering around, half of them just looking for the course. It's pretty hairy out there. Well, I tell you, I don't like it when it starts getting dark. Well, there I was up in the hills, and it's dark, and it's cold, and I'm freezing. Jesus, it's murder in the dark. You're so tired. It's, it's painful. Your eyes ache, your hands are numb around the steering wheel. But you know you got to keep going, and if anybody ever asks me why, I'll cold cock them. to get to a place in my whole life. Hey, Doc. Hey, hey, <laughs> ah, no top, but it's fine. Yeah. Okay, you guys, you know, I'm out ahead of everybody, I think. <laughs> Gorgeous tomorrow. You hang around the finish line until dawn the second day. If a driver or a team hasn't made it home by then, you know another piece of machinery is going to be a part of the desert landscape. Most of these guys will be back next year. And there'll be some other fellas that's trying it for the first time. Whatever the course is, it's still the Baja. They'll be back. 
and I'll be back. Because these are my people. This is my world.